An even more significant challenge to the complacent 50s came from America's black community. Living in the consumer society but having few of its advantages, they chose this moment to make white America live up to its ideals. Amazingly, 50s America had moved little beyond the days of Jim Crow. Particularly in the South, life among blacks and whites remained separate and unequal. It was no way you could be black in this country and not be affected by it. Here I was selling millions of records around the world, hero everywhere, and I couldn't get a hot dog in Baltimore unless it went to the back door. It wasn't right, but that's just how it was. That was just life. On December the 1st, 1955, on a public bus in Montgomery, Alabama, life began to change. By refusing to give up her seat to a white man, a tired seamstress named Rosa Parks quietly ignited a revolution. The day that Rosa Parks was arrested, a low murmur went through the whole city. And overnight, this thing bloomed. Led by a charismatic young preacher named Martin Luther King, the city's black community organized a peaceful boycott of the buses. They walked instead. We will do it in an orderly fashion. This is a non-violent protest. We are depending on moral and spiritual forces. White policemen responded by arresting black carpool drivers. White extremists bombed King's home. Martin always said, you know, if you don't have anything that you die for, what do you have to live for? Nobody thought we could stay off the buses. None of those people wanted to lose their jobs. But Martin Luther had instilled in them so rightly that we must all make a sacrifice that the buses continue to run empty. They did for 381 days. On November the 13th, 1956, the Supreme Court ordered the buses desegregated. Martin Luther King was now the undisputed leader of the civil rights movement. The colored population idolized Martin Luther. We are not going back to the buses bragging about a victory. People experienced the self-esteem that they had never experienced this before. Be and they had been given for the last 12 months. a light a beacon at the end of the tunnel. That light reached Melba Beals, a 15-year-old high school student in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was very conscious of what was going on and wanting it to wash over me and wash over Little Rock. It was about to. In 1954, the Supreme Court had ordered the integration of all public schools in its famous decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. Three years later, that decision would be severely tested at Little Rock's all-white Central High School. Despite the federal court order, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus had no intention of allowing black students to attend Central High, and he ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school. On September the 3rd, Melba Beals and eight other black students walked towards Central High. One, Elizabeth Eckford, became separated from her friends and was surrounded by a white mob that included Ann Thompson. There was just a lot of electricity in the air. It, it was almost a circus-like atmosphere. All these parents on the sideline urging us on and telling us, you know, get out there, don't let them get in. There are uh, mobs on her heels, you know, like dogs, nipping at her. The policemen are watching this. Every time she tries to step between them, they close ranks on her. 
If Central High was to be integrated, it would have to be by order of the president. Eisenhower was at first reluctant to interfere. His record on civil rights was not a good one until 1957, in the crisis at Little Rock. And there, a fundamental question was dealt with. Do the states have the right to impose their own social order in defiance of federal court orders? Eisenhower answered it decisively, said no. We have made a national commitment. We are going to desegregate this society. And if it takes the 101st Airborne to do it, so be it. This is awful. It was, I mean, it, that, that is vivid still. You know, I could just see Little Rock just being in a state of siege by the, by the, Troops, you know. That was real fear. Three weeks after the Little Rock Nine were turned away from Central High, they returned accompanied by troops of the 101st Airborne. We're all in an army station wagon, uh, machine gun mounts. It's a pretty heady day. Uh, it's not what uh, everybody gets to go to school. You got a thousand paratroopers, you got helicopters, jeeps in front, jeeps behind. And we stepped out of the jeep into this uh, square of soldiers who were serious. You know, as I walked up the steps that day at Central High School, I can remember the click of the leather boots on those things. And I remember being so impressed by who they were. You know, these are Americans. I'm an American. And so the first time I get the feeling that there is hope, that there is a reason I salute the flag, that this is what America is about. I felt that Little Rock would never be the same again. We would never know life as we'd known it again because nine people walked into a school building. My teenage models had been the kids who danced on American Bandstand. And all of a sudden had come the Little Rock Nine. And I can remember having the feeling that they've been tied and, and tested and they've survived. Someday, in some way, I'm going to be tested this way too. Uh, so I think when the movement comes along in the 1960s, I'm ready for it. By the late 1950s, driven by the powerful economy, the American people's long-running fascination with automobiles was changing the very fabric of the country. The car came to be the dominant symbol of American life and had an impact on American life that is difficult to exaggerate. Americans were now confronted with a dazzling array of choices on the showroom floors. So many that for the first time, people began to view cars the same way that they once viewed clothes or hairdos, as an emblem of their personality. Ford Thunderbird. Even the name had a ring to it. A yellow station wagon. A station wagon provides room in the back to carry the lawnmower that's broken. My boyfriend drove Chevrolet, and I thought, that's the prettiest car I've ever seen in my life. I felt like a queen in that car. <laughs> General Motors had a budget the size of Poland's. Nationwide, every seventh job was related to the automobile industry. The term drive-in became a part of a language. There was a national hotel chain created entirely for road travelers and a restaurant that spoke exclusively to a newly mobile country.
But the most profound effect of the car on American life, the one that actually altered the landscape, was the immense new federal highway system begun in 1956. The largest public works project in history forever connected American motorists from city to city, from coast to coast. We used to study those maps, which would show you proposed interstate highway, interstate highway under construction, and then the payoff, completed and opened. And we'd get on those interstates and run those great big cars with the big fins on them. It was just wonderful. It just opened up the whole world to us. What most Americans did not realize was that the freeways had been built with an ulterior motive. The overpasses freedom-loving motorists were driving under were built 15 feet high in order to allow the easy movement of missile systems. President Eisenhower approved the project in part because he wanted military traffic to be able to move easily in the event of a national crisis. In the frivolous 1950s, people lived under the ever-darkening shadow of the Cold War. The U.S. and the Soviet Union each now had massive arsenals at their disposal. The Cold War struggle seemed to be everywhere. In Hungary, when people rebelled against the Russian occupation in 1956, they believed that America would intervene on their behalf. This was very difficult for the United States. After all, we've been saying the liberation of Hungary is important to the free world and so forth. Well, what were we going to do about it? What the Russians put in there was so much in the way of tanks and troops that this would have been a major war. It's just heartbreaking. At the height of the crisis, with the Russian tanks on the street below, these kids in Hungary had control of the radio station, and they were broadcasting, SOS, SOS, the tanks are here, we need help. You promised to help us, where is our help? And there was no answer. Maybe 10,000 Hungarians died at the altar of the superpower competition, a competition that was taking on apocalyptic overtones. It had taken the Soviets four years to duplicate the American success with the atomic bomb. It took only eight months for them to do the same with the hydrogen bomb. Well, there wasn't any doubt that everybody was building them as fast as they could. We've got to build them, we've got to improve them, and keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. The need to test the new weapons was seen as so urgent that the U.S. government even put its own troops in harm's way. Ten seconds. Within a few months of the successful Soviet hydrogen test in 1953, Several thousand American troops were ordered into trenches in the Arizona desert. One of them was Korean war veteran Reason Wehrheim. The purpose of it was to test the reaction of the troops uh, to an atomic bomb. Five, four, three, two, one. That shot went off. You see this real bright light. With your hands over your eyes, you could see the bones in your hands. Then there's this noise that just feels like it's compressing your head. It's so loud. There's a feeling like you're in a vacuum cleaner, like your whole body's been vacuumed. The house. 
house that was in front of us it was no longer in front of us. It was gone. Of the 2,584 men that were there, there's only three of us still alive. How many Americans were affected altogether can never be fully determined. The fallout from this explosion, known as Shot Simon, reached as far away as New Jersey, among the dirtiest of the 200 above-ground nuclear tests that took place between 1954 and 1958. The same frenzied pace of experimentation was applied to the rocket program. Both superpowers saw them as crucial for the delivery of powerful nuclear payloads. American scientists were not always having much luck. I saw the rockets that were pointed north go south, and those that were pointed south go north. I saw one go straight up in the air and explode. I saw one go straight up and come straight back down again. But never during those 100 launches did I see anything go right. On October the 4th, 1957, someone did get it right. We say, attention, all radio stations of the Soviet Union are broadcasting. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. This first satellite was today successfully launched this beep, 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 what is it? Sputnik. Sputnik is around the globe. Who did it? We did it. The Soviet Union. First in the space. And I can remember going out to my backyard one night, looking up at this bright streak going across the sky and I felt a sudden sinking feeling, one of almost terror. Now, suddenly, you've got Soviet missiles that can reach into the Dakotas, can hit Chicago. With a surprise attack possible for the first time, Americans began to look at the sky differently now as a place from which terror might reign. And to learn some new terms like duck and cover. I felt that the threat to America had been, had been increased, that the Soviet Union had upped the ante. While we were playing uh, cops and robbers hide and seek uh, in our backyards and our front yards, there was the gnawing anxiety that it could all end instantaneously. On April the 12th, 1961, the Soviet sent cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into orbit around the globe. The first Sputnik in 57, and then Yuri Gagarin going into space in 61, terrified the American people. People were sitting around and talking about what would we do if the Russians had arms, missiles, whatever, on the moon? And could shoot, we were making the stuff up, but shoot, shoot at us at will, then we'd have to surrender, you know, we had to choose better red than dead. That's what people were thinking then. All right, uh, let's go. 
In what would become a spiraling series of superpower moves and counter moves, just three weeks after the Soviets' manned launch, the U.S. sent astronaut Alan Shepard into space. And President Kennedy promised even greater heights. We choose to go to the moon. A man on the moon walking on the moon? Now, in this decade? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You gotta be kidding. But Kennedy wasn't kidding. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. This bold push into space was also seen as an aggressive manifestation of the Cold War. And so was a Kennedy-supported CIA scheme in April of 1961 to land Cuban exiles in their homeland to ignite an uprising against Fidel Castro. When the mission failed, leaving the exiles stranded at Cuba's Bay of Pigs, America and the president were humiliated. Three months later, as if sensing American weakness, Khrushchev demanded that all Allied forces be removed from Berlin. We cannot and will not permit the communists to drive us out of Berlin, either gradually or by force. Kennedy put the United States pretty close to a war foot. A lot of people like me got draft notices looked like we were going to war. For the second time in the century, Americans faced the threat of war over Berlin. But now, both sides had nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. No president ever spoke more frankly to the nation about the real possibility of nuclear war. In the event of an attack, the lives of those families which are not hit in a nuclear blast and fire can still be saved if they can be warned to take shelter, and if that shelter is available. We owe that kind of insurance to our families and to our country. Families were advised to build bomb shelters. Schools held atomic attack drills. When I was a kid, I was very worried about the bomb. I used to sit under that desk thinking, now, would the radiation fall on top of the desk and miss me? But what happens when I get out from under the desk? Then will the radiation fall on me? I didn't quite get it, but it didn't seem to be sensible that I was hiding under this desk. And so I had this worry, and everybody talked about this worry about the bomb. This nuclear threat over Berlin was diffused, but the Soviet-American confrontation would continue. In October of 1961, the Soviets began building the Berlin Wall. The wall would become a symbol of the Cold War's brutal reality. The newsreels presented Americans with haunting images of people risking their lives to escape communism. Once a country went communist, uh, it stayed communist. They had secret police and the whole totalitarian structures so that there was no regressing. That the Soviet Union and its allies were formidable. Global presence seemed very clear to me. An even more direct threat to American security began to unfold on October the 14th, 1962, when American U-2 surveillance planes flying over Cuba made a discovery. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that the Soviets would introduce uh, nuclear-tipped missiles into Cuba uh, targeted on the eastern part of the United States. They never had moved nuclear weapons off the soil of the Soviet Union. We didn't believe they would. They did. It was my father's decision and, and his own idea. It was only one reason to show that we are great power and we will protect all our allies and if any border will try to fight against our allies that will mean the beginning of the Third World War. The Cuban Missile Crisis would last for 13 days that October, 
the president and his most trusted advisers try to figure out how to get Khrushchev to remove the missiles from Cuba. As far as the president was concerned, this was a superpower confrontation. It was the Soviets who had put nuclear missiles in Cuba. It was the Soviets who would have to remove them. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. The U.S. military was put on the maximum level of alert, DEFCON 2. The president ordered the Navy to mount a blockade around Cuba. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. For 72 hours, the world watched and waited as Soviet ships approached the quarantine line. They kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming. So there would be these days of incredible tension. Millions of Americans believed uh, that they were about to die. We literally sat and talked about the fact that we were living then out in the wilds of New Jersey uh, and were we far away from New York City to survive. I remember, I remember that really being a terrifying moment. I was at NYU at the time. And the, the professor uh, was sitting there and he looked up at the, watch, the clock on the wall and he goes, well, they'll be meeting about now. They're meeting now, so we'll just have to wait. And there was like deep silence. And nothing happened, you know. There was a deep breath. And then the Soviet premier ordered his ships to turn back. In the end, the Soviet leader agreed to withdraw the missiles in return for a U.S. pledge not to invade Cuba. There isn't going to be any learning curve with respect to nuclear weapons. You make a mistake with respect to a decision to use nuclear weapons, you're going to destroy nations. Both Khrushchev and Kennedy realized how close they'd come, and they were determined to avoid that in the future. In 1961, the author James Baldwin wrote, To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage all the time. There was two worlds, a black world and a white world. As a young child, I remember very well seeing the signs, and, and I resented it. If you went to the Dairy Queen, white people would go in and sit down. You got your ice cream at a window. I never rode a bus because I knew I'd have to sit in the back. I uh, didn't go downtown to the movie theaters because I'd have to sit in the Jim Crow gallery. I, I remember on one occasion I tried to go to the county library and we couldn't even go in and check out of a book. That did not change until the Civil Rights Movement. In the early 1960s, young people would take the lead in the battle for racial equality. Federal courts had ruled that segregated waiting areas in bus stations were illegal, but the law was not being enforced. To pressure the Kennedy administration to intervene, activists rode public buses into the Deep South to integrate the facilities. Outside of Anniston, Alabama, the bus carrying the first group of self-proclaimed Freedom Riders was firebombed. By the time the Freedom Ride started, there was a realization that some of us would have to die and that we should not fear death. And we liken this very much to military service, that if you serve your country in the military, you might lose your life. We were serving our country at home. We knew that this was a very dangerous mission. 
but we felt we had a moral obligation uh, and a mandate to, to make this trip. John Lewis, then a student leader, was a freedom rider on a bus that arrived in Montgomery, Alabama. The very moment we started down the steps, a mob out of nowhere, people by the hundreds, came out with baseball bats, stones, chains, and started beating us. I was hit in the head with a wooden crate. And I was left lying unconscious in a pool of blood. I thought I was going to die. Many of the young people in the Civil Rights Movement united in an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC is special because we are young. We're 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. Most of us have dropped out of school, so we're no longer students, but we don't have mortgages, we don't have car payments, we don't have families, we don't have husbands and wives and children. So we can do these things. And because we're young, we're also foolish, and we're willing to take risk. We wanted to create a mass movement. We wanted to get hundreds and thousands of people involved. We had been talking about developing a, a nonviolent army that would be prepared to go into a community, be arrested, court arrest, and so forth, break down that fear of jail as a weapon, and also break down the infrastructure of the local area by filling up their jails. All right, let's stop it right here. It was a tactic that SNCC took to Albany, Georgia. Anybody who found the courage to be involved could be involved. In the first weeks of the Albany campaign, more than 500 young people were arrested. Once you get in jail, it's a sobering experience. Because jail is not like a rally, and jail is not like a march. Some people would get into jail, they would clang those doors, and they would actually cry. And then there would be people who felt that we're in jail and we need to pray. Then there were teenagers who wanted to do rock and roll or they were talking about their boyfriends. And it was in jail where I began to be asked to sing a lot. And no money to go to bail. Keep your eyes on the prize, oh Lord. Paul and Silas began to shout, jail door open and they walked out. Keep your eyes on. If you're in the movement, all of the singing is one way of being heard and announcing your presence. You can't sing a song without producing power. And you will often see people singing in the face of police. If I sing, you stand in my sound. In Albany, Georgia, we force the jails open by numbers, and they could not stop us from singing and praying. The movement was energized, but the law did not change. The nine-month effort to desegregate Albany, Georgia, failed. The next major campaign was fought on even tougher ground. It was probably the most violent and vicious racist city in the South. There had been 60 bombings of black people's homes in Birmingham in 61 and 62. One target for the movement in Birmingham was to desegregate the schools. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, had promised they would stay white. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Our demonstrations in Birmingham were usually simply marches to the courthouse or to City Hall. And we almost never got more than two blocks from the church and then we were arrested. Day after day, hundreds of demonstrators filled the Birmingham jails. Among those arrested was the organizer of the Birmingham campaign, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. By then, he was the acknowledged leader of the entire civil rights movement. My heroes for the second half 
of the 20th century, Martin Luther King. All of these people are people who accepted the fact that you have to put everything online. Because if you don't, you're not going to get anything. Not in America. Because America is not going to change. Only you can change. As part of the campaign, Dr. King enlisted an army of school children, aged 6 to 16. After the first day of demonstrations, nearly a thousand of them had been herded into police vans and sent to jail. The next day, the police changed their tactics. The law enforcement in Birmingham was headed by one Bull Connor. And Bull Connor was an old-fashioned lock them up, throw them in jail, throw away the key, beat them up, put dogs on them, hose them down with fire hoses. Anything he could think of to try to stop this movement by force, he did. I watched the violence in Birmingham on TV. It shocked me to see the dogs being unleashed on people, and it shamed me. This was the front page of every major newspaper in the world and it told a story that America was ashamed of. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. Trying to raise congressional support for the Kennedy Civil Rights Bill, civil rights leaders called for a march on Washington. On August the 28th, 1963, more than 200,000 people showed up. Once I got there and saw the crowds coming from all over America, black and white, poor people, rich people, show business, politicians, Martin called it a coalition of goodwill or a coalition of conscience that could change the soul of the nation on the race issue. This was bringing a mass meeting into the homes of millions of Americans who were seeing this thing that I had seen over and over and over again in small town churches everywhere, seeing this for the first time and hearing the oratory of America's premier orator, Martin Luther King. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I remember thinking when I saw Martin Luther King that he was going in his dream to bring the nation along, that he was irresistible in his call to mercy and love. I mean, that he was absolutely the most irresistible voice that had ever been heard. Freedom and justice, I have a dream. My poor little children, one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. You know, I was a little young. Uh, I do remember it. Martin Luther King was a very powerful effect on me, but it wasn't so much that I understood what he was saying, but I knew that he stood for me because I needed somebody to stand for me. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. To me, that day represented one of the finest hours in American history.
In the early 1960s, answering the president's call to action, young people had a new way in which to serve, the Peace Corps. The Corps' first director was the president's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver. Messages kept pouring into the White House from people, younger people for the most part, but older people too, saying, yes, I'm ready to serve. I thought joining the Peace Corps was a perfect way to do good in the world. I mean, I thought it was sort of hands across the ocean. Uh, then I was going to go and help the poor people of the world do something better with their lives. Marnie Mueller was sent to Guayaquil, Ecuador. It was somehow giving people the notion that if they got together, they had power to make change. The Peace Corps was also a way to counter the appeal of communism in the developing world. Other young Americans responded to the president's Cold War call more directly. We're being trained to, uh, to be in the military, to do what the military does, to fight if we have to, to defend the country. So, I mean, we all wanted to go. We thought, I mean, this was, this was our, our, uh, our job. On the same day that President Kennedy established the Peace Corps, he provided more funds for an elite group of warriors called the Special Forces. They would become known as the Green Berets. This is another type of warfare, new in its intensity, ancient in its origin, war by guerrillas, subversives, insurgents, assassins. The very first mission for these highly trained soldiers would be in Vietnam in Southeast Asia. When President Kennedy took office, there were a thousand military advisors in South Vietnam sent there to defend against what America believed was communist expansion. It was a policy based on something called the domino theory. In a sense, we saw if Vietnam falls, the dominoes will fall. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia would fall under communist domination and they would be strengthened across the globe. And it was to prevent that that Kennedy felt he had to make a move to, to strengthen the South Vietnamese government. The South Vietnamese government, run by Ngo Dinh Diem at the time, needed the help. The leader of North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, wanted the North and South to be reunited. He was supplying guerrillas in South Vietnam who were growing in numbers and aggressiveness. In Vietnam, you had an insurgency, Viet Cong. They are the insurgents. We've become specialists in counting insurgents. Bill Bowles was one of the first special forces sent to train South Vietnamese troops in the fall of 1961. President Kennedy had increased the number of military advisors to more than 3,000. We had trained these, this civilian irregular defense group for maybe a month and we decided to send them to villages around Da Nang, and we had four Americans out there. And uh, on the way between the villages, they were ambushed by the Viet Cong. And two of my buddies were killed, and uh, two others were missing. I was shocked. Uh, I guess more than anything, it, it brought home the idea, hey, this is not play. This is not a game. This is not a training exercise anymore. This is kill or be killed. By 1963, the situation was deteriorating. On the streets of the South Vietnamese capital, Saigon, President Diem, desperate to maintain control, was cracking down on his political... We, in a sense, we saw Vietnam disintegrating before our eyes, or at least the, the, the structure of the state disintegrating. Diem had lost control of it. As I left the air in 63, it was obvious that, uh, that the war was escalating. We had uh, camps in places that you couldn't even say the name. And uh, we had more people getting killed than ever before. America would commit more and more soldiers. It would become the longest war in American history. It was fought largely by young men, described by one journalist as rock and rollers with one foot in the grave. There was so much to feel good about at home. The country had never been more prosperous People were looking towards a bright future. At this point, they trusted their leaders to solve the problems elsewhere. World peace like community peace. 
does not require that each man love his neighbor. It requires only that they live together in mutual tolerance. In June of 1963, in a speech the president gave at American University in Washington, it seemed that maybe even the anxieties of the Cold War could be dispelled. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements. Khrushchev and Kennedy had both convinced the world that they were real tough guys uh, and they wouldn't back down. That's exactly the time that people then sit and negotiate out their problems. Both men understood that and Kennedy laid that out. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. Two months after that speech, the U.S. and Soviet Union agreed to the first comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. Dean Acheson said once that the office kind of confers a nobility on the man. And during Kennedy's tenure in office, uh, we had a very exalted sense of a president. Our young emperor, you know. In the summer of 1963, John F. Kennedy's political and personal ratings were the highest of his presidency. Because he was the first young president, he was a towering cultural figure. I mean, the pictures of him walking around with his little kids and whatnot had enormous impact. It made us feel 10 feet high. We thought that we were invulnerable. And what a crowd, uh, what a tremendous welcome he's getting now. We can, uh, and there's Jackie, she's getting just as big a welcome, and the crowd is absolutely going wild. This is a friendly crowd in downtown Dallas as the president and the first lady pass by. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by just a moment, please. It did seem as though everything came unpinned. I was sitting in a dental chair when the, the first bulletin came over, but then the bulletins became increasingly serious, so that within an hour, about the time I was out of the chair, yeah, Jack Kennedy was dead. So I dictated my story that day, and this was such an unexpected, uh, unbelievable thing that it happened. It was terribly emotional. No Americans living at that time had ever witnessed anything like this, the assassination of a president. I mean, that, that assassin's bullet killed something else. The feeling of if you're exalted, you're invulnerable. All of a sudden, you know, even this guy is vulnerable. I cried, like many, many Americans. Uh, you no, know, we had our differences, uh, but I felt we had lost a friend. We had lost uh, a leader. It was such a source of inspiration. How do we make it? How do we survive? Where do we go from here? With the death of Kennedy, the end of the feeling of uh, progress was never going to end. The innocence, the, uh, uh, everything coming, everything, the reality, a slap in the face, a national car crash. I think some of the self-confidence of America died that day. Some of the optimism of America died that day. Walking up Connecticut Avenue to the church and 
you look at the people who were watching us walk up the street, and there was absolute incredulity on the face of every living person. You get their eyes and your eyes, and what they were looking at you for was hopefully to get some expression from your face, from your eyes, that would help them to understand what had happened and why. And nobody understood it. <laughs>